Welcome back to the 33rd Annual National Federal Society Student Symposium here at University of Florida on the issue of security versus freedom. Today's panel, we have Mr. Stuart Baker, who is a partner in the law firm of Steptoe & Johnson. He practices in issues relating to privacy, national security, and computer security. He was the first Assistant Secretary for Policy at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security under President George W. Bush and was the former General Counsel of the NSA in 1992 through 1994. Professor Randy Barnett is a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and teaches constitutional law and contracts. He is a director of the Georgetown Center for Constitution. He was a criminal prosecutor in Chicago and was one of the lawyers challenging Obamacare. Professor Jeremy Rapkin is a professor of law at the George Mason University School of Law. Previously, he was a professor at the Department of Government at Cornell, and he's the chairman of the board of Center for Individual Rights. My name is Ricky Paulson. I'm the Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court. I'll be your moderator. I look forward to the remarks by our panelists members, and afterwards, afterwards we'll take questions from the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, um, I'm going to, uh, I, I thought about going through a deep legal argument about uh, some of the uh, NSA issues uh, since I uh, used to uh, be their chief counsel, uh, uh, but I thought that uh, it might be uh, uh, more useful and more entertaining at this hour of the morning just to tell some stories with some points uh, that will help frame the, uh, the debate. Uh, um, and I am going to make two or three points, which is, uh, you know, it, it, trying to do intelligence gathering under a strict legal regime has real costs, one, maybe more costs than we're willing to pay, uh, that more civil liberties, uh, more privacy is not free. It comes at a, at a very significant cost, a cost that we've paid uh, in the past. Uh, and finally, that what you're doing, the debate that is going on inside the right uh, as we speak, makes an enormous difference uh, right now, not, not in some future administration. Uh, uh, and it's, it's very important that you take this deeply seriously and think about all the consequences. Uh, so let me, let me start with a story from the 30s. Uh, um, uh, the U.S. government uh, gave up much of its intelligence capability in the late 20s and the early 30s under the principle that uh, gentlemen don't read other gentlemen's mail. Uh, and uh, indeed, in 1934, uh, the uh, Communications Act made it illegal to uh, conduct wiretaps, or at least it seemed likely that it made it illegal to conduct wiretaps uh, or any interceptions, including uh, uh, over-the-air signals. Um, and that created a problem for the U.S. Navy as they became increasingly worried about what the Japanese Navy was up to and what the Japanese government was up to in the Pacific. And they started saying, you know, we need to get inside these communications. We need to break these codes. But we've got this problem. It's not clear that it's legal to do it inside the United States. We've got, we got a Japanese uh, embassy sending messages home every night, all in code. We can intercept them and break them if we're lucky, uh, but we're not sure it's legal. And that hung over them for much of the 1930s until George Marshall of Marshall Plan fame and Secretary of State fame and winning World War II fame said to them in the 30s, just do it. Now, you know what would happen to somebody who said just do it today. We'd be deep into the, the criminal investigation and maybe the trial. Uh, instead, what happened was they did break those codes. 
They won the Battle of Midway because they broke those codes. Uh, I, and George Marshall was not indicted. He became a hero of the United States with considerable justice. Um, the problem that they had in the 30s, though, was pretty, pretty real. They could hardly go to Congress and say, Congress, this law is having a big impact on national security. You need to change it. You need to give us an exception. Th that would have required a public debate about their concerns about Japan, uh, their desire to break Japan's communications, so their uh, ability today to uh, access those communications and uh, 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 intercept them preparatory to breaking the code. To, and you couldn't have had that debate without alerting the target that you were in the process of watching them. This is a fundamental problem that intelligence under law always have. Once you've written a law and you think it makes a lot of sense, the technology or the times change and the law doesn't fit anymore. We are all familiar with laws that uh, have to be amended from time to time because of technology or other changes. Uh, uh, but you can't have the debate about why you need to have those changes without alerting the very people that you are most interested in uh, uh, gathering intelligence on. This is a perennial problem. The solution that George Marshall came to was the solution that we settled on for 40 years from the 30s until the 70s, uh, which was, it's not possible. There's law and there's national security and we need to keep them separate because otherwise national security will not really be served. That was a perfectly rational decision. It's the decision that every government outside the United States has also more or less arrived at. Uh, uh, but in the 1970s, so that, I'll just stop there. We are having a debate today about how much open discussion of our intelligence methods we can have. But there's one thing is clear, that when Snowden says, I want to have a debate, so I am putting out, these uh, putting out all of these documents to disclose all of these programs, to compromise all of them. He's not saying, I want to have a debate. He's saying, I want to win the debate by making it impossible, even if you're persuaded that you should continue these programs, for the programs to continue because they have been compromised. Uh, uh, and much of the debate that we're having today is dangerously verging on making the tools that we're talking about lack use, useless or close to useless uh, even if uh, the uh, programs are reauthorized so that's that's point one and I guess I should I should I should tell you um, sort of like the magician who explains the trick what I'm doing I when I started practicing law I had a mentor who had been Henry Kissinger's uh, um, uh, legal advisor at the State Department, and he was a very old guy. He must have been 60. I, great. I, I wasn't sure that was going to be a laugh line here. Um, and uh, I, he used to tell me about the disaster that the uh, Smoot-Hawley tariff brought on the United States and the economy and the like, and it was deeply compelling. It was like hearing history speak. It was great until I, I kind of looked up his bio and I realized he was like two years old when Smoot Hawley was passed. So I, I, he was telling me what he had learned, uh, not what he had experienced. But he was so old and he had so little hair and what he had was so white that you just kind of said, oh, wow, history is speaking to me right here. So that's what I was trying to do to you. Um, <laughs> but I, now let me talk about something that I uh, did live through, uh, uh, which is... Uh, um, uh, what happened in the 70s and then what happened in the 90s. In the 70s with the uh, uh, intelligence scandals and the deep uh, hostility to the, U to the uh, government and its national security arm that came out of the Vietnam War, uh, there was a backlash against uh, the intelligence agencies. They were viewed as lawless. And we embarked on an experiment of imposing legal restrictions and detailed legal restrictions on the intelligence community, uh, uh, including the FISA Act, which was passed in 1978, uh, setting very strict uh, judicial oversight and um, uh, rules about when 
uh, certain kinds of intelligence could be gathered. Prior to that, and, and this is still you know, an open question of the Supreme Court, the view uh, uh, of the executive branch, thanks to uh, General Marshall, was uh, this is an entirely something that the uh, executive does. We decide what n national security requires, and if it requires a wiretap, we just do it. Uh, that wouldn't stand in the 70s in the hostility that uh, the Vietnam War generated, uh, and so we ended up with a law that tried to regulate it. Uh, and the FISA court uh, was created at that time. Uh, I came in to the agency in the 90s, uh, early 90s, under George H.W. Bush, uh, and uh, um, it was clear that that was the most traumatic and significant event in the careers of everybody there and in the life of the institution. Uh, uh, and they were absolutely determined that they would never again be accused of lawlessness. And so there is a deep, deep compliance culture at the agency. I remember we, we were taking the attorney general around. This is after I it was not a political position at the time. So uh, we, uh, we ended up with uh, Janet Reno coming in as a new attorney general. Uh, and she wanted to come out and uh, wag her finger and make sure that we stopped violating the law. Uh, and um, the uh, director of NSA uh, was walking her around through a Warren, uh, almost as thickly populated as this, with people with uh, uh, earphones on and uh, screens to type on, uh, and he stopped by some uh, uh, sergeant uh, who was doing that. And he tapped him on the shoulder. The guy took off his earphones, and he said, um, "Sergeant, uh, this is the Attorney General. I I'd just like to ask you, what do you do when you?" intercept an American when you're uh, doing uh, overseas uh, 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 intelligence gathering. And he rattled off exactly what the law was and what the procedures were. Uh, and I thought to myself, God, you know, the first rule of lawyering is you never ask a question that you don't know what the witness is going to say. But the director was so sure that everybody in the workforce understood these rules and had deeply uh, uh, inculcated them, uh, those rules, that he could ask anybody and get uh, the right answer. It was a remarkable thing, and it, it made a difference to me as I was talking to uh, um, the institution. I used to say that uh, I don't know what's worse, um, having an engineer tell you what the law is, or going back and looking it up, spending an hour uh, going through the statutes and the regulations and finding out he was right. Uh, so it, it is a, it, it, because they never wanted to go through the 70s again, they have been deeply committed to uh, uh, following uh, uh, the law. The FISA court, um, let, me, let me tell you about what happened in the 90s and why I think it's relevant here. This is, I'm now on to the notion that more privacy and more civil liberties do not come free. One of the ideas that was prominent, especially in the Clinton administration, uh, uh, was that uh, um, we ought to use uh, intelligence more uh, to make um, criminal cases against people who were national security targets, uh, uh, whether it was uh, drug running dictators in Cent Central America or terrorists, we could use criminal law to attack them and we should take all of our intelligence gathering and use that to support the prosecutors. Uh, uh, there was a big debate about that inside the U.S. government about it. And I was on one side and uh, many of the Justice Department prosecutors were on the other. Uh, and, and the argument that I made at the time that I deeply regret now was uh, I said, um, look, we have enormous capabilities, incredible capabilities, and we are aggressive as hell at trying to get inside the communications of our targets. Uh, uh, but that's not what we ought to be doing to American criminal justice suspects. We should be using the tools and the uh, statutory and constitutional restrictions that apply to criminal law, and we ought to keep our capabilities separate from that. Let the FBI investigate the criminals, and we'll go after the targets who are trying to kill us in mass numbers. Uh, uh, and 
to, to make sure that, that we observed that, it's a civil liberties doctrine, we said there ought to be a wall between law enforcement and uh, intelligence. The intelligence community gathers uh, its stuff and shares it, and we use it for, for national security purposes, and the law enforcement guys investigate crimes, and we should have very, very strict rules about letting stuff go from one side to the other. Now, that was a debate that you're probably a little familiar with because of its consequences. What happened was uh, the FISA court gradually came to believe that that wall, that civil liberties doctrine, that privacy doctrine was absolutely essential and that parts of the Justice Department were determined to break down the wall. And so the FISA court decided that it wasn't going to rely on the Attorney General to enforce that wall anymore. It was going to take those rules and write them into the orders that it issued to uh, the FBI and to NSA saying, there's a wall and you won't talk to anybody in law enforcement. You will not have any communications. You will not pass on this intelligence to law enforcement. Uh, uh, and it became stricter and stricter to the point where it started driving that wall right into the FBI and it said, I know you've got an intelligence side and I know you've got a law enforcement side. I know your intelligence side consists of 14 uh, uh, people who are badly paid and aren't agents and so in the FBI where, as they say, there are agents and there's furniture, uh, they're on the furniture side. Uh, uh, but you will not let your law enforcement guys get information from the intelligence side. And the court was so aggressive about that, it made people swear they were not sharing this information across that line. And then when it found that somebody had done that, it demanded an investigation. It said, I will never again accept a, uh, uh, an affidavit from this person who has lied to me which meant that he had to lose his job in uh, uh, the bureau as head of a, uh, a terrorist investigative uh, uh, unit. And it was likely that the investigation was going to lead to some kind of uh, 1001 perjury type uh, um, uh, prosecution. It was doing that with fervor and the enthusiasm of somebody standing up for civil liberties right through August of 2001. And so when the uh, NSA and uh, um, uh, the CIA discovered that there was somebody in uh, the United States, two people in the United States who were Al-Qaeda uh, uh, terrorists, uh, and the coal bombing task force, a criminal task force which had all the resources of the FBI and some of the best agents said, let us go find them. The answer that came from the lawyers and from the court was, you do that and you risk your career. Sit down, shut up, give it to the furniture. Two weeks before 9-11, we had that information. We gave it to the furniture. They didn't find them. The coal bombing task force could have found them. I'm convinced. Uh, we lost our best chance to stop that attack right there. And because, in substantial part, of the FISA court's determination to impose a civil liberties doctrine, I, I should say, completely without any legal justification, they were making up the law. Uh, the, uh, um, when this finally was appealed after 9-11, the uh, appeal court said there is no, absolutely no basis for what the FISA court did. They just made it up because it would make them civil liberties heroes. Uh, I, and they, just, they, they knocked down the wall. But nobody even had the nerve to appeal it in the climate of 2000. Uh, uh, I say that because I, I think it's important that we recognize that when we demand more privacy, when we demand more civil liberties, uh, when we insist that the uh, National Security Agency, in this case, have more and more people devoted to making sure that we don't gather t intelligence too enthusiastically, we are going to pay a price for that. Uh, and I, I, I feel a sense of personal responsibility, uh, as I testified to the 9-11 Commission, for having been such an advocate of maintaining that wall uh, in the first place. Uh, so that's the, the, the second thought. Uh, and the third, um, what you're doing right now makes an enormous difference. Uh, I, I want to start uh, uh, just read you something that uh, 
uh, Cato said uh, about the president. Uh, let's see. Yes, here we go. The administration has supported warrantless wire, uh, national security searches, expanded government wiretap authority. It's a dereliction of duty, says Cato. If constitutional report cards were handed out to presidents, this president would certainly receive an F, an appalling grade for any president, let alone a former professor of constitutional law. Doesn't sound particularly surprising, except they said that in 1996. Uh, this is, we are going through now a civil liberties critique uh, in the second term of a democratic uh, president that resembles exactly the civil liberties critique that we had of the last second term democratic administration and resembles surprisingly, although perhaps the uh, personalities are different, uh, the civil liberties critique we had in the second term of a Republican administration when all the critiquing came from the left. Uh, uh, there is, there was such a thing as Clinton derangement syndrome. There was a Bush derangement syndrome and we are suffering from Obama derangement syndrome today. It is a deeply tempting thing and a deeply satisfying thing to take a former professor of constitutional law, to take the things that he said and that you know he believes, and jam it down his throat because he is engaged in using um, the, uh, the national security apparatus in ways that resemble what we think he's doing with the IRS or HHS. Uh, uh, it was deeply satisfying in 1998 for Congressman Barr, uh, for uh, 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 co Congressman Army, uh, to, to lambaste the administration for privacy violations. Uh, uh, and I have to say, it contributed to the climate in which it was impossible for the Justice Department or the National Security Agency to say to the FISA court, what you're doing is utterly lawless. We are going to appeal it because it would have been covered in the press and it would have been treated by the Republicans and many of the Democrats on the Hill as basically the government trying to get out of civil liberties obligations. We're creating the same climate today. And, uh, and this is, you know, uh, frankly why I'm so troubled. Uh, I'm a conservative Republican and to see conservative Republicans stand up and say things that I believe are going to end up uh, creating problems for our ability to defend ourselves is deeply troubling. I, I, and so uh, what I would say to, uh, to close is it, it, the fact that we only control one House of uh, Congress uh, does not mean that our voices are not heard, does not mean we are creating a, a political climate. We are part of the political climate. And what Justin Amash says matters uh, and it will influence what the uh, government is able to do and its willingness to take risks to protect us and to find the intelligence we need uh, uh, to protect ourselves from terrorists or from uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, uh, and so when we speak, we need to recognize that deeply satisfying as it may be to jam these words down the president's throat and to criticize him for one more overreaching uh, 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 bit of use of executive power, uh, it needs to be true. There is no evidence, I am confident of this, there is no evidence that the National Security Agency has been used for partisan political purposes at all. There's really no evidence that it has knowingly violated the law. Uh, you can argue about whether the law should have been what they uh, interpreted it as, uh, but they got legal advice uh, to a fair thee well. Uh, and to treat them uh, and their mission as just one more IRS, HHS, Obamacare uh, scandal, I think is doing great damage to the country. And frankly, we should stop. It was a great talk, Stuart. Um, I'm very happy to be on my panel with uh, my old friend Jeremy Rabkin and my 
co-blogger on the Vala Conspiracy, uh, Stuart Baker, and uh, it's, I congratulate the students at the University of Florida for putting on this wonderful event. I was here to talk to the Law Review last year, uh, their Law Review banquet speaker, and I always enjoy coming to Gainesville uh, to get this beautiful uh, uh, Florida weather, sorta. Um, and I appreciate all of you coming. The, I, I assume this is the group that did not go to the after party uh, last night. Uh, they, they're going to be coming in uh, later this morning. Um, before I start the remarks that I plan to make, uh, I do, do want to, uh, uh, I'm going to say a lot, I probably will say more in the Q&A about the points that Stuart made, but I, I want to begin by saying that, you know, I'm somebody who uh, went to law school uh, in order to become a criminal lawyer, uh, and in particular to become a criminal prosecutor, because I believed in law enforcement. I believed in going after the bad guys. I believe that the only legitimate function of government is to protect our rights, either from domestic bad guys or from international bad guys. Um, and I decided after law school that I was going to spend my time uh, dealing with the domestic bad guys. And I admire uh, those who have spent their time dealing with the international bad guys. Um, I thank the military that I see in uniform whenever I see them. Um, I thank Stuart for the time that he spent in the National Security Agency. I actually, uh, unlike some of my libertarian friends, do not wish to question the good faith of those who work at the National Security Agency. I assume that the overwhelming number of them, if not all of them, are there for the same reason I was a criminal prosecutor, that is to do right by the country uh, that they uh, serve. And so I just want to keep that in mind as we go forward here, because that's not really um, what bothers me. I supported the passage of the USA Patriot Act after the attack on 9-11. The attack on 9-11 uh, had a deep effect on me, as it did on most people uh, at the time, although it's somewhat receding uh, in memory. I supported, uh, contrary to the consternation of many of my libertarian friends, uh, American military action taken in the wake of 9-11 uh, in order to bring the war to the enemy, as opposed to sitting here and playing defense and nothing but defense. Um, but still, I think, still I think, uh, something is happening uh, because we're dealing with what is sometimes referred to as a long war, which means a perpetual war, uh, something is happening here that we need to take note of and that has disturbed me and I believe has crossed the line. And I'm going to try to identify today what I think that line is. Now, we only have found out uh, about the nature and scope of the programs that we're going to talk about, that we've already talked about last night and going to talk about again this morning due to um, the unauthorized leaks of classified information. Uh, we found out about the uh, telephone metadata collection, the bulk telephone metadata uh, seizure program, uh, as well as other programs. And I'm not going to get into the details of those programs in this talk. You heard actually a good deal of those details last night. It was a very nice uh, setup panel for what we're going to talk about today. But remember, uh, all we know about those programs, or mostly what we know about these programs, are as a result of uh, uh, unauthorized leaks of information that may be partial. Uh, there has been some additional release of information by the administration in response to that. But again, that may also be selective. We can't be, honestly, quite sure about the full nature and scope of these programs. And everything that's said to you with complete certitude uh, by people who are speaking publicly uh, may or may not be the full scope of these programs, uh, but I'm going to assume that by and large they are for purposes of this talk, and I'm going to focus instead on the big picture, not on the details. Um, in particular, by that I mean the, the fact that the NSA is now demanding that private companies with whom virtually all Americans contract to provide their voice communications turn over their records of every phone call that is made on their system every phone call that's made on their system, and then that so-called metadata is stored on NSA supercomputers for later analysis. In this talk, I'm not going to address the legality of this program under the existing statutes, the so-called uh, Section 215. Uh, two federal judges have held that the, that the uh, government has not waived its sovereign immunity to uh, challenge those statutes, and therefore they cannot be challenged in federal court. Uh, but by the same token, those same two federal judges, one who upheld the program and one who struck it down, said citizens do have standing uh, in federal court uh, to challenge the constitutionality of these programs, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, we're going to be limited to the constitutional issues raised by these blanket seizures of data, um, the blanket seizures of data on all Americans. Um, although the only surveillance program that's been challenged in court so far um, concerns phone records, the principle, the constitutional principle that is being offered in support of this data seizure program would apply as well to all other business records of our dealings, including our credit card transactions. So um, 
Indeed, and this, this, this point was actually made by the judge uh, in New York, the New York District Judge uh, William Pauley of the, North, of the uh, Southern District of New York, in his decision upholding the constitutionality of these laws. Um, he held uh, that, uh, he said in a footnote in his opinion, that an individual has no constitutionally protected expectation of privacy in bank records, records given to an accountant, subscriber information provided to an internet service provider, and information from a home computer that is transmitted over the internet or by email. The logic of his opinion would reach all of that information as well. Imagine the chilling effects on liberty if everyone knows that the government is in possession of all this data about their private transactions on its supercomputers. The relationship between the citizens of the United States and their supposed agents or servants in government would be fundamentally reversed, turning we the people into mere subjects of our rulers. So there is a lot more at stake than just this particular bulk data seizure program that's being administered by the NSA, however properly it is currently being administered by the NSA. With the challenge to the Affordable Care Act, and I see some friends out here who were participating in that challenge from the state of Florida. With the challenge to the Affordable Care Act, we not only wanted to stop Obamacare from being implemented, which sadly we failed to do, we also wanted to defeat the limitless constitutional arguments that were being offered in its defense. And in this effort, I'm proud that we succeeded. Now, we need to think very hard about whether these blanket data seizure programs comport with the Fourth Amendment before the government decides it needs to seize data about every other facet of our personal lives. Now, as you know, and it was just said last night, the Fourth Amendment has two parts. First, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And secondly, no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the places to be seized and the persons or things to be seized. We know that the Fourth Amendment was adopted to prevent, among other things, what were called general or nonspecific warrants, which were blanket authorizations for British authorities to search for contraband wherever they might choose. In response to this abuse, the Fourth Amendment required the things to be searched and seized or seized under a warrant um, to be described particularly. And by the way, just to point out, textually, the Fourth Amendment applies both to searches and also to seizures. Searches and also seizures. Forget seizures for later searching. With this in mind, the problem with the data collection orders issued by, to Verizon and other telecommunications companies becomes obvious. These orders require the company to produce, and I quote now from the order itself, on an ongoing daily basis, all call detail records. Because they are not particular, such orders are the modern incarnation of the general warrants issued by the Crown. As with general warrants, blanket seizure programs subject the private information of innocent people to the risk of searches and seizures, without with searches and exposures, without their knowledge and with no realistic prospect of a remedy. It is also worth remembering that both the English Whigs and the American founding generation thought that the seizure of papers for later search was an abuse distinct from but equivalent to the use of general search warrants, which is why papers was included in the Fourth Amendment in addition to effects, which would refer to personal properties. Papers could be considered effects, but they were separately enumerated papers. Um, uh, in addition to personal pro other personal property. As University of San Diego uh, pr law professor Donald Drips has shown in a recent article, quote, at the heart of Whig opposition to seizing papers was the belief that any search of papers, even for a specific criminal item, was a general search. It followed that any warrant to sift through documents is a general warrant, even if it is specific to the location of the trove and the item to be seized. The seizure of papers for later perusal was thought to be closely akin to searching through a person's mind to assess his thoughts. Seize first, then search for evidence of criminality was considered to be the epitome of an abuse of power. Putting such information permanently in the hands of government for future use is an invitation to restrict the liberties of the people whenever such restrictions become politically popular. For example, gun rights advocates such as myself have long opposed firearms registration because the brute fact that the government does not know where the guns are makes it much more difficult in the future to confiscate them. Not only does this illustrate the practical danger 
to constitutional liberties posed by the government possessing vast information about our activities and associations for later search, the trove of phone and email metadata to which the NSA now has access would make gun registration itself unnecessary, as the go government would already possess enough information to identify most gun owners in that metadata. So how have these programs been justified as constitutional? You heard a bit about this last night. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna basically just summarize what you heard. The answer lies in two key Supreme Court cases. The first is the 1967 case of Katz versus United States, which concerned the power of law enforcement to wiretap a public phone book. At this point, I need to explain to some of you what a public phone booth was, because it actually makes a difference in understanding how Katz works. It's, a, it's an enclosure. It was used to be made of glass. Uh, you walked into it, you shut the door behind you, and there was something there called a public telephone, which actually did survive long after public, uh, public phone booths disappeared. Uh, and then you made a call. You put coins in this device, and you, and you made a call. You can put a local or maybe a long-distance call. You never know. All right, so at any rate, um, that's what a phone booth was. Uh, Katz is taken for the pro to stand for the proposition, and you heard this last night, that the Fourth Amendment only protects communications about which people have a reasonable expectation of privacy. That's the key phrase. Because people reasonably expect their conversations in a phone book to be private, their conversations cannot be wiretapped by law enforcement without first obtaining a search warrant. The second key case is Smith v. Maryland, decided in 1979. Again, you heard about that last night. Smith applied what is called the third party, party doctrine to phone call information that is in the possession of phone companies. In Smith, the court reasoned that individual phone users have no reasonable expectation of privacy in the records of their phone calls. The numbers called and the duration of the calls because phone, record, phone users know that a third party, the phone company itself, has access to this information. The court therefore held that law enforcement agencies do not need a warrant to install what is called a pen register on a telephone account that records the numbers called and the duration of the calls, but not the content of the conversations. When the Foreign Intelligence Surve and Surveillance Act, or FISA court, I'll say a few words about whether that's really a court or not uh, at the end, uh, responding to public concerns, released its privately its previously secret opinion upholding the constitutionality of NSA's data seizure program, we learned that it thought that the, quote, production of telephone service data provider, pr provider metadata is squarely controlled by the U.S. Supreme Court in Smith v. Maryland, unquote. The court reasoned that the NSA data collection orders are constitutional because all they collect is the very information that in which Smith tells us that telephone uh, consumers have no reasonable expectation of privacy under CATS. I think you'll agree that this logic seems rather persuasive. And indeed, it has persuaded many legal experts. It's persuaded Stewart. It persuaded Steve, it's persuaded Steve Bradbury, who you heard from last night, and commentators along with District Judge Pauley of the Southern District of New York. It persuaded him as well. So let's talk a little bit about Smith. There's a big difference between what happened in Smith and what the NSA orders are doing. Let's talk a little bit about the facts of Smith. In Smith, a robbery victim had described to the police both her attacker and a 1975 Monte Carlo she saw near the scene of a robbery. Afterwards, she began receiving threatening and obscene phone calls from a man who said he was the robber. During one phone call, the man asked her to step onto her front porch, where she saw the 1975 Monte Carlo moving slowly past her home. Later, the police spotted a man who met the victim's description of her attacker driving a 1975 Monte Carlo in her neighborhood. By tracing the license plate number, police learned that the car was registered in the name of the petitioner, Michael Lee Smith. They then asked the phone company to install a pen register at its central offices to record the numbers dialed and the telephone, uh, from the telephone at his home. Although the police did not obtain a warrant, they certainly had a reasonable suspicion, to say the least, that Mr. Smith had engaged in illegal activity. If the constitutionality of the NSA bulk data seizure program is to be justified as akin to a pen register under Smith, then these programs amount to installing a pen register on every American without any suspicion that a person whose phone activities are now stored in the NSA supercomputers has done anything wrong. In essence, every American is to be treated the way Michael Lee Smith was treated in Smith v. Maryland. But like, unlike the pen register on the phone line, on his phone line, that only lasted a few days, each of us would have pen registers on our phone lines every day for the rest of our lives. In the old days, the government had to go to a third party, the phone company, 
to request that the pen register be installed, which preserved a record of what it was doing and provided some kind of a sort of a pragmatic outside check on the government's request. And then again, in the old days, uh, the very massiveness of such a data trove, if they could collect all the information on everybody, would have itself prevented the government from doing anything with it because they never would have been able to compile it, store it, and assess it. Today, however, enormous quantities of data can be kept digitally on huge NSA supercomputers um, and subject to data computer analysis to reveal suspicious patterns. Indeed, that's what we're told it's going to be used for. But others have, def uh, others have defended the program not for the re revelation of secret patterns or suspicious patterns, and the rationale we also heard about last night, but simply to, 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 keep, to retain the information so that it may be more conveniently searched in the future, more efficiently, effectively searched in the future. But once in possession of the data, the federal government can use it the same way the British authorities use paper seized with general warrants. To late, for later perusal to see if they re reveal anything criminal. The NSA data seizures make possible phishing expeditions into the phone calling patterns of nearly all Americans, except for the terrorists who will now avoid using their phones given the revelation about the program. So just basically it's just us. If this is the result, then there must be a flaw somewhere in the constitutional doctrine that produced it. And I think the fault lies in the misuse of the third party doctrine as well as in Katz's problematic conception of reasonable expectation of privacy. The key to understanding the problem is to remember that the Fourth Amendment was, above all else, the solution to the problem of general or nonspecific warrants. In Smith v. Maryland, a pen register was placed by the phone company on a particular person about whom there was a reasonable suspicion, though perhaps not probable cause for seeking a search warrant, and therefore it was considered to be reasonable. Indeed, most every previous application of the third party doctrine to business records, such as bank records or emails, has concerned the investigation of a particular person or a particular company or possibly a particular set of companies. So the first problem is that Smith v. Maryland is being stretched to cover a situation that is radically different than the law enforcement practices the court was addressing there and in subsequent cases. Because this, is, this ongoing blanket data seizure program of every phone record in the country is quite literally unprecedented, the rationale of Smith cannot automatically be extended to this situation. This was the position taken recently by Judge Richard Leon of the District Court of the District of Columbia in his opinion, finding that the NSA program violated the Fourth Amendment. The question before me, he wrote, is not the same question that the Supreme Court confronted in Smith. To say the least, whether the installation and use of a pen register constitutes a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment under the circumstances addressed and contemplated in that case is a far cry from the issue in this case. Indeed, the question in this case can more properly be styled as follows. When do present day circumstances the evolution in the government's surveillance capabilities, citizens' phone habits, and the relationship of the NSA and telecom companies become so thoroughly unlike those considered by the Supreme Court 34 years ago that a precedent like Smith simply does not apply. The answer, unfortunately for the government, he wrote, is now. While lower courts are certainly bound to follow Supreme Court precedent, they are not required to extend general statements made by the court in one situation to an entirely different context. Lower courts are supposed to grapple with applying existing doctrines to new situations, but that includes identifying the limits of existing doctrines given the circumstances under which those doctrines first arose. The crucial difference between Smith and all the third party business record cases you hear about is particularity the difference between a general warrant that the Fourth Amendment was enacted to prohibit and a reasonable particularized search of, or seizure which is all the Supreme Court has ever purported to authorize. But when this case does go back to the Supreme Court, as I hope it will, the court should also reconsider the reasonable expectation of privacy concept of cats, how it is used. As Justice Alito observed two terms ago in his concurring opinion in the GPS, in the GPS tracker case of U.S. v. Jones, the cat's expectation of, quote, the cat's expectation of privacy test involves a degree of circularity and judges are apt to confuse their own expectations of privacy 
with those of the hypothetical reasonable person to which cat, the, ta the cat's test looks. In addition, he wrote, the cat's test rests on the assumption that this hypothetical reasonable person has a well-developed and stable set of privacy expectations. We should all remember that the reasonable expectations language that now dominates academic literature and the case law actually appears not in the majority opinion in the court, of the court in Katz, but in a solo concurrence by Justice Harlan. In contrast with Justice Harlan's concurrence, Justice Stewart's majority opinion in Katz properly rested on the physical protection that the defendant had given to his oral communications when he stepped into a phone booth and closed the door. That's the reason why you need to know what a phone booth is to appreciate what Katz was really about. What a person knowingly exposes to the public, Justice Stewart wrote, even in his own home or office, is not a subject of Fourth Amendment protection. But what he seeks to preserve as private, what he seeks to preserve as private, even in an area accessible to the public, may be constitutionally protected. Rather than airy and untethered judicial speculations about reasonable expectations, the court should return to the traditional and more readily administrable property and contract rights focus of the Fourth Amendment protection that was reflected in the majority opinion in Katz. Courts should examine how people employ devices that function like the walls of a home or the phone booth in Katz to conceal digital information and preserve their privacy. An inquiry into the physical and legal barriers that have, people have placed around their information, for example, by using passwords to restrict access to their email, we're all told our passwords aren't serious enough, they have, to be, they have to be more serious, they have to be longer, they have to be more complex, they have to be so complex that even you can't remember them and access your data. We all know that whatever it is, our passwords just aren't good enough. What is that if not a creation of a zone of privacy, an expectation of privacy? Um, it creates a zone, a threshold across which um, of personal security that the Fourth Amendment should require a warrant to cross. Again, not that law enforcement can't get to it, they just need a warrant to get to it. No distinction should be made between sealing a letter and handing it to the postman, taking a phone call in a secluded phone booth, password protecting one's email, or selecting a communications company with a privacy policy. The physical and legal barriers that people place around their information define both their actual and their reasonable expectations of privacy and should provide the doctrinal touchstone for the search warrant requirement. When people put their information behind passwords, they reasonably expect it to be private, every bit as much as Mr. Katz did when he shut the door to the phone booth. When one has arranged one's affairs using physics and the law of property and contract to conceal information from prying eyes, the government, government agents may not use surreptitious means and novel technologies like thermal imaging to defeat those arrangements without obtaining a warrant that conforms to the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. For this reason, the court was correct in the 2001 case of Kelo versus United States to hold that police officers had conducted a search when they used a thermal imaging device to detect heat emanating from a private home, even though they had committed no trespass. Putting oneself behind closed doors created a zone in privacy in which the police ought not to intrude without a warrant. Smith v. Maryland need not be reversed to distinguish its application from the radically different practice of installing pen registers on everyone. Whereas Smith differed, uh, concerned a particularized search that may well be, have been reasonable under the Fourth Amendment, the NSA bulk data seizure program is the modern day equivalent of a general warrant that strikes at the very heart of the Fourth Amendment's requirement of particularity. Both the third party doctrine of Smith and the reasonable expectations privacy of Katz, uh, approach of Katz needs to be adapted to modern circumstances. Now let me conclude by noting that without these recent leaks, the American public would have had no idea of the existence of these programs, and it still cannot be certain of their scope. Every day seems to bring new revelations about domestic surveillance by federal agencies. As you heard last night, some of this is reliable information, some of this is not. The secrecy of these surveillance programs, however, is inconsistent with a Republican form of government in which the citizens are the principals or masters and those in government, their mere agents or servants. For the people to control their masters, they must know what their masters are doing, at least in a general way. And I asked uh, Attorney General McCasey this question from the floor at the Federal Society of National Lawyers Convention about whether he thought it was necessary in a Republican form of government for people to know about these programs in a general way so as not to compromise actual operational details, and he agreed. Moreover, until these two district courts found 
over the government's objections, I should add, that citizens had standing to challenge the constitutionality of these bulk data seizure programs. Their constitutionality had only been assessed solely in secret by the FISA court that Congress established to scrutinize the issuance of particular business record, uh, business record subpoenas and warrants. Let me say just one word about the FISA court. There's a whole panel coming up next about it. Uh, let me just say it's not a court. These are staffed by Article III judges. They're honorable people. One of the FISA court judges is a personal hero of mine, Judge Roger Vinson of the Northern District of Florida, who was the district court judge that invalidated Obamacare. Um, he's a hero of mine. Uh, he's a FISA court judge. There's nothing dishonorable about being a FISA court judge, but it is not a court. A court requires a case of, an Article III court requires a case in controversy in which people have standing in order to contest a particular lawsuit. That's what gives federal courts jurisdiction. All of you know it who go to court and don't have standing. There is no such case or controversy in front of the FISA court. It's not a court. It is an administrative arm of the executive branch. Staffed by judges, it may be a very nice procedure, an internal procedure to have, but this is not the same thing as going into an Article III court. However, both courts who have now considered this case, Article III courts, have said citizens do have standing to go to an Article III court and contest the constitutionality of this law. And so, therefore, that problem is being ameliorated right now. We can go court, real courts, a real court, can actually evaluate the constitutionality of this program, and that's a good thing, and that's already been done. The secrecy of these programs and the proceedings by which their constitutionality was assessed make it impossible to hold officials and appointed bureaucrats accountable. There's nothing wrong with the FISA judge system. You have to have a judge you can go get a search warrant for. You have to have a judge you can go to get a record from in order, and these, with using classified information, and the judges who have security clearance are needed for this. When I was a prosecutor and we had search warrants approved, it was an ex parte procedure in which you went to a judge and the judge signed the search warrant. That's the way search warrants are issued. There's not a problem with that. The problem when the FISA court was called upon to pass upon the constitutionality of the entire program, not specific warrants. It's a useful program for passing upon the, the sufficiency of particular warrants. Internal government checks and even secret congressional oversight are no substitute for the sovereign people being the ultimate judge of their servants' conduct and offers. It doesn't matter whether Dianne Feinstein knows what's going on as long as we don't know what Dianne Feinstein is supposed to be overseeing. But such judgment and control is impossible without the information that secret programs conceal. If these blanket seizures of privately held data are upheld as constitutional, it would constitute an unprecedented legal and constitutional sea change. It is not a policy that should emerge from an advisory panel of judges to which the people are not privy. The American people are no longer the subjects of King George and his general warrants, nor should we be subjected to these modern day general warrants by those who are supposed to be our servants and not our masters. Thank you. Well, um, I'm looking forward to Stuart Baker's um, reply, but let me just lower people's expectations uh, for this debate. N not just the one here, but in the country. Um, Steve Bradbury said yesterday several times, a very healthy debate, very healthy debate. Uh, I really started to think uh, he should have gone to medical school. Um, Look, this thing that's gotten all this attention, uh, Section uh, 215 of the Patriot Act, is due to uh, expire next spring. It was reauthorized in 2011. This is way before Snowden, way before people really understood what it was, a four-year expiration date. Uh, now, its prospects of being reauthorized next spring are very poor. Whether our debate has been healthy or not healthy, uh, I think people have made up their minds. Uh, a very substantial majority of Democrats voted uh, for the Amish Amendment last uh, August, saying abolish uh, this. Um, quite a lot of Republicans did too. Um, that's last August. Uh, just in the last few weeks, uh, Reince Priebus, the chairman of the Republican Party, said, uh, we should oppose this. Republicans should oppose um, reauthorization of this. Um, a lot of Tea Party favorites are, like uh, Ted Cruz, are denouncing this. So I think there isn't support for this. So I think it is probably um, going away. Um, I want to say why I don't regret that. Um, the first thing is I just think it's inherently um, 
creepy. Uh, the National Security Agency is a military agency. It's really an arm of the Pentagon. It is the military basically um, surveilling in the United States. Yeah, they're safeguards. Yeah, they're honorable people. Yeah, they consult lawyers. I'm not casting aspersions on them, but just the idea of the military doing surveillance in the United States. Uh, and, you know, we're told it's got, it's got a really a lot of value. It can be extremely valuable. And I, I just want to um, say I'm skeptical of that, now speaking about bulk data. Um, the Europeans are more concerned about terrorism than we are because they've had more of it and they see more people around them who are saying, oh, yes, we'll go. Okay, so they're, they're nervous. Um, they don't do this. They do a lot of other things. I'm not praising them. I'm not setting them up as a model, but they don't do this. And when the Snowden revelations came out, a number of uh, prominent Europeans, uh, I was most struck by uh, Bernard Kushner, former uh, foreign minister, under Sarkozy in France, and he said, well, of course we knew that you did spying, but wow, so much, wow, how can you, how can you do it on such a scale? And it was like uh, Jack Nicholson's Joker in uh, the first Batman movie, where do you get all these gadgets? <laughs> uh, what they do is they send people into mosques to listen and take notes and then come back and report. They do targeted surveillance, uh, and maybe we can't do that on the same scale, but at least they are looking at people who they have some reason to be suspicious of. And we are saying, but let's just blanket the country. Let's just get all this data, and then maybe it will be um, useful. I'm, I'm very skeptical of that. Um, to me, it seems like the equivalent of um, we know that somebody might uh, want to carry a bomb on a plane. Let's not focus on the people who might um, be plausible suspects. Let's make everyone in America take their shoes off and their belts off, um, and then we'll all feel safer, even if we don't. Now, it happens. I mean, there's been a lot of polling on this, and despite the healthy debate, uh, you still have a majority of people in America think uh, this is being used not exclusively for national security purposes. If that's true, it really is very costly. I, I want to emphasize what um, Julian Sanchez said, which I thought was a tremendously good point yesterday. Um, the cost is not just to the people who have something in their particular personal life exposed to public view. That, that, that's very few people. Maybe it's no one so far. The cost is to everybody in America thinking, uh-oh, they're watching. And that is costly. That, that the reason why we want to have constitutional government is so that people can feel confident about living their personal lives without the government constantly being a threat to them. And this is very costly if the majority of people in America think the government is spying on them. So I don't regret that this thing probably is not going to be revived. But now I want to move on and say uh, why I really think, however healthy this debate has or hasn't been, um, it's not, I want to emphasize this, going to, um, to change people's opinions. Um, so. I don't want to be guilty of Obama derangement syndrome, um, but people have a lot of reason to be um, distrustful. Um, let's just start with the big fact which we all know and have all just like walked away from, which is the NSA was unbelievably careless with the information which they had been collecting. It's really stunning, it's shocking, it's unbelievable that they had this guy who was basically nobody, a contractor in Hawaii, who had access to all of this stuff. And we don't know how much he gave away. And what is particularly astonishing about that, and really, I mean, it's just heartbreaking. You just think, damn, the government is so incompetent. This is more than two years after Bradley Manning had already done this. And everybody said after Bradley Manning, oh, Oh, well. And they just moved on. People at the NSA were supposed to be so alert. They're so vigilant. They're on top of everything. Didn't notice the Bradley Manning episode. Didn't think, whoa, we might be vulnerable to that. Well, it's come out in the last uh, few weeks that actually someone wrote a memo in 1997 saying, you know, we at the NSA should worry about this because, you know, people could, like, tap into our own files. And, and it was published in a 
in a uh, computer science, uh, no, 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 cryptography journal of the NSA. They had 20 years notice that, oh yeah, well this might be a problem. They just didn't pay attention. So that's bad enough. It's hugely bad. It's really, really bad. But what's even worse is the president's reaction was, yeah, well, I mean, no one's perfect. Um, if I could just make the comparison to Bush, people went crazy about uh, Hurricane Katrina. Well, Bush at least did fire the head of FEMA after everybody decided that FEMA had responded badly. No one was fired at the NSA, and just like no one was fired at the State Department previously when Bradley Manning uh, got into all the State Department uh, cables. Um, we act as if it doesn't really matter that much what the NSA does. Well, if that's how we're acting, if that's the signal Obama is sending, of course people say, well, we, we don't trust them. Um, uh, James Clapper seems to me, seems to most people, lied under oath. He himself characterized his testimony to a Senate committee as it was the least untruthful answer when I said we weren't collecting uh, emails and data on people. I'm sorry, least untruthful? That's, that, that's not a defense to a perjury charge. That was really, that was really outrageous. And um, we, they just said, well, you know, he's not the best guy. I mean, never mind. Never mind keeps being the answer. Uh, so then it came out that, well, actually some people in the NSA had actually used uh, their position to spy on uh, their girlfriends. This has a technical term, love int, uh, ha ha. Uh, what happened to those guys? And we were told, oh, don't worry, they've been disciplined. They've been disciplined? What, is, what does that mean? Wh were they fired or not? Are they being sent to jail or not? Are they being sent out of the, what happened there? But, never mind. So of course people don't trust them. What the president did um, was he said, well, I'm gonna, have, uh, I'm gonna have a committee look into this. Top people, they are, they are top people. Uh, it's the president's, um, uh, well, I left it there. Uh, the review group on uh, surveillance and uh, technology, something like that. And it was uh, basically uh, two guys from the Obama administration, uh, two guys from the sort of liberal law professors, and Cass Sunstein, who was both. Uh, and they were given uh, 10 weeks, uh, look around, come back and report. So they come up with 46 recommendations, the kind of things liberal law professors would say, the kind of things uh, people in the Obama administration would say. Cass Sunstein said, let's do cost-benefit analysis. Uh, some of them might have been good suggestions, some of them not, but they say on the very first page, uh, I'm sorry, let me just... It's really worth quoting exactly. They say, uh, this report should not be taken as a general review of or as an attempt to provide a detailed assessment of the current practices. In other words, we didn't have time to find out what's actually happening. Uh, Obama received this report uh, in December, then in mid-January he gave a speech and he said, well, my review group has shown that there, there were really no abuses. N no, it didn't show that. They said, well, we didn't have time to find out. Okay, so maybe some of these are good recommendations, maybe they're not, but Obama just basically treated this as, I've been given a clean bill of health by <laughs> people that I appointed who are my friends. Uh, there were no Republicans. Uh, there were, no, I mean, like maybe a federal judge, maybe somebody who could speak with some authority. No, this was basically a clique of, you know, his friends who very quickly came up with this, hey, 46 things we could do. And then Obama said, well, I'll take recommendation number 2, 7, 15, 32, and 46, the others no. Um, no real explanation of this. Um, two things that he decided to embrace were like particularly curious. Um, he said, yeah, let's have a privacy advocate who will participate in the FISA proceedings. I mean, there won't be public proceedings. The, the actual target of the investigation won't be informed, so it won't actually be adversary, but let's have a privacy advocate there. So one of the judges of the FISA court, purporting to speak for all of them, said, actually, we don't think this is a good idea, because he was responding to the initial recommendation. And um, President Obama said, yeah, let's do it anyway. He, he didn't explain why. He had a different view from the FISA judges, who you might think know more about it than he did. He just said, well, like, yeah, that's something we can do, sure. 
Uh -huh. uh, then he said, um, uh, we should... Um, uh, we should um, take up a few of their other um, proposals. Uh, yeah, the big one was uh, the telephone bulk data should be left in the hands of the telephone companies. That's a good suggestion, he said. Then, by the time he gave his speech, he said, um, well, actually, it's a little bit complicated because I've been told that... Um, Actually, uh, it's going to be problem integrating the different data sets, and we haven't worked out how to do that if it remains in private hands, but never mind, it's a good suggestion, and they'll work out the details. So it gave every appearance of being unserious. Unserious, leaving up to the answer to every other challenge, which is never mind. Uh, I think the president is treating this the way he's treating the IRS scandal, which, let me just briefly say, is very disturbing. People give information to the IRS on the understanding that it's going to be confidential. And when the IRS leaks this, I'm not even talking about going after the Tea Party groups. The thing that was, I think, the most really alarming and disturbing was somebody in the IRS leaked information on who were contributors to the National Organization of Marriage, which was campaigning against um, same-sex marriage um, initiatives, and then these people were harassed. So that's, that's very alarming. It means you cannot trust the IRS to, be, to keep your confidences when you give them confidential information, like w w what groups you gave money to. Uh, what's, what was the outcome of that? The president said, no one's more disturbed by these revelations about abuses in the IRS than I am. And then six months later, he said, there is no scandal there, right? In other words, never mind. So if problems in the NSA are always going to be greeted with, oh, well, never mind, then it's kind of like the war in Afghanistan. I can't shut it down, but I'm not going to defend it, and never mind, let's not pay attention. On that basis, of course the thing is not going to be reauthorized, and it's hard um, to regret it. Let me just remind you, uh, the president has asked for uh, trade promotion authority, fast track authority, to negotiate trade deals. And everybody has said, no, the Congress will not give that to him because they don't trust him. So wait, we don't trust him to negotiate a trade agreement, which still has to be voted by Congress, but we do trust him to supervise the NSA when it's turned loose to collect a vast amount of data. I, I, I don't see it. I want to say um, two other things before I sit down so that I can appeal to Stuart Baker um, and give him something else to talk about. Uh, one aspect of this, which has been almost completely lost, is, um, although Mr. Elliott talked a little bit about it yesterday, uh, the betrayal of the tech industry. This was a really bad thing that we did to them. We asked them to cooperate with the government. We asked them to give information. And then we let it be revealed to the whole world that this was going on, and not just revealed, but revealed in a highly sensational, distorted way, so it made them look really bad. So of course, they are upset. They now get it that the government is not a partner. The government is totally unreliable. The government is, as you know, it's as bad as the IRS. Uh, but it's worse than that. I mean, there are all these stories now that the NSA basically um, leaned on the National Institute of Standards to uh, make sure that encryption codes so that people could maintain their privacy would have a little backdoor so the NSA could sneak in there. Uh, the president's uh, review group, Cass Sunstein and his friends, um, they say, uh, we didn't find any evidence that this was going on, but um, it should stop. They're not doing it, but they shouldn't do it again. Uh, well, what this is basically saying is you cannot trust American uh, encryption data, and you can't trust data that's in the hands of American tech companies. And the consequence of that is not just bad publicity. It's that all over Europe, people are saying, whoa, we need to stop dealing with American companies. We need to find European companies. And both Angela Merkel and uh, Francois Hollande have said, yeah, we need to have a European internet. We need to have European uh, internet service providers. We need to make sure that uh, people in Europe can talk to each other and, and send data back and forth without uh, having all of this shared with the NSA. 
uh, it's true Europeans have always wanted to um, get business back from the American tech industry. They are kind of resentful that um, we have such an overwhelming lead over them. But this is really giving them a, a very reasonable, at least as people in Europe see it, a very reasonable basis to say we need to exclude American companies or at least find ways to promote uh, European alternatives. And to start with, this means a lot of money is going to be lost to American businesses. Um, there's some estimates that over the next three years, which is about the planning horizon of people in that industry, because th three years down the road there'll be big changes, who knows what. But some estimates of $20 billion over the next three years, some estimates of more than $100 billion of lost business, lost sales to American companies. That's, that's starting to be something real. Uh, and um, it may be down the road that it makes it harder to maintain an internet, which really is a world wide web. There's already China net, there's already Iran net. This is basically encouraging Europeans to think there ought to be Euro net. So there, there are serious consequences down the road. And my sense of this is that um, the NSA and the Obama administration, they're just totally unserious about this. That, that was not important. What was important was, getting all the metadata because just in case somebody might have a query and we'd be ready to deal with it, they had no real sense of the, the weight of what they were dealing with. Um, and here's my last point and then I will sit down. Um, we were starting to have a debate just before Snowden about how to protect uh, American companies to start with and American private citizens from uh, hacking and other kinds of uh, well, stealing of uh, data, as well as people who basically disrupt your denial of service attacks and then say, if you pay me some money, I'll make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, General Alexander, the head of NSA, said, uh, this is costing us $250 billion a year. This is very serious. Over a period of years, he said, mm, that's now like a year and a half ago, before Snowden, he said, this is the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world. American companies are vulnerable to systematic stealing of not only intellectual property and trade secrets, but, uh, but just a lot of other things which are going to China or going to Russia or going to uh, open criminal markets where it's sold to the highest bidder. This is very alarming and disturbing, said General Alexander. We need to think about what to do. Okay, what to do? And of course, he didn't say anything about what to do. I mean, he just said, yeah, this is serious. People in Congress were debating what to do. Uh, I think, and Stuart Baker, who speaks with much more authority, thinks uh, we ought to be trying to get the tech industry more actively involved to, to hit back, at least to trace the origin of attacks, to do a lot more because they have the expertise, they have the energy. I think they're probably somewhat sharper and brighter than people at NSA, um, who are, it's not nice to say, but bureaucrats. Um, that's gone, right? It's gone because the industry is now very wary of cooperating with the government and Congress can't think about anything else. And the NSA has basically said, well, we need to protect our secrets and we can't tell you exactly what we know and how we're doing it. Um, so the costs of this have been huge and I think it is not regrettable if we turn the page next year and said, and say, we're not doing this. We need to think about much more um, focused, down-to-earth ways of uh, identifying terror threats, but we should not have the government uh, jeopardizing the internet for the whole of America. Thank you. Well, plenty to work with there, I guess. Um, a couple of thoughts on uh, um, uh, Jeremy's statements. I, I, look, I'm not going to stand here and say President Obama hasn't been feckless in dealing with uh, the national security issues raised by this. Uh, uh, the failure to aggressively defend uh, the technology industry uh, uh, from attacks is pretty significant and uh, the, the reluctance to really engage to save this program uh, is uh, also a sign that he may be perfectly content to let this program die as long as conservative Republicans take the blame. 
And that's exactly what we're going to get if we're not careful. Uh, uh, because fecklessness, frankly, runs in both directions. Uh, uh, why are we not having a discussion about Chinese attacks on uh, uh, U.S. companies? Uh, why is the tech industry in so much trouble abroad? Why are we uh, uh, facing uh, uh, the failure of 215? Uh, uh, it's largely, why has the American public come to believe, despite no obvious evidence, that uh, this information is being used for something other than national security purposes. It's because people like Jeremy, people like Randy, people like many of the folks in this room have helped to persuade them with feckless claims about what the Obama administration must be doing with that data. And to say there's no Republicans who have looked at this program for abuses is going to come as real news to Mike Rogers, who thinks he is one. Uh, and to say, well, he's obviously not the right kind of Republican because he hasn't attacked the program suggests that we're only interested in the attack, not in the facts. And I think all of that is a fecklessness that we own, not the president. Uh, so let me, let me turn back briefly to some of the constitutional stuff that, uh, that Randy talked about. First, Randy, I got to say, I totally believed you were all alive when they had phone booths. Uh, it, 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 the, that entire constitutional discussion kind of reveals, or to my mind at least, uh, why bringing all of this constitutional uh, artillery to bear on national security issues is so dumb. Uh, it, it is. At the end of the day, if Randy got his wish and he established that, by God, you couldn't seize this data, you had to leave it with the phone companies, how many people feel more secure because all of that information is stored at the uh, uh, phone company and it requires a 26-year-old assistant U.S. attorney to get a piece of paper out of his desk drawer and sign his name to it before that information can be gathered yeah, okay, that's right. That, 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 that is about right, and, and you're doing it mostly to tweak me because you... you <laughs> the, the fact is, the real problem you've got with it... First, that, that data is probably more heavily protected at NSA than in the hands of the phone company, which receive 1.3 million requests from a 26-year-old assistant U.S. attorneys and similar investigators a year to get that information under doctrines that have allowed the government to take every single uh, um, uh, money transfer out of a, an office in Kansas City uh, to anywhere in the world uh, uh, on the theory that that's relevant to their investigation of possible money laundering. Uh, uh, the standards for getting access to this information and the ways in which it's treated afterwards are uh, astonishingly lax. Uh, compared to what the National Security Agency does with that. You might say, okay, well, I don't like that either. Uh, uh, how many of those guys have gone to jail to uh, pick up on Jeremy's inquiry for, uh, for misusing this information to check on wh who that blonde is seeing down the street? Uh, uh, probably nobody. Uh, this, some of these abuses do occur. They are much more likely to happen with the data that is actually stored with the uh, uh, phone companies than the data that is stored in this program. The, the practical difference is it's better protected at the National Security Agency. But you can make an, an elaborate constitutional argument that, oh, well, it makes a big difference because the government has seized it. Yes, you can, uh, absolutely. But when you are done, you won't have changed anybody's privacy at all. The problem is there's more data and it's given to more private sector people and therefore it's subject to subpoena uh, 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 all over the world. And the real doctrine that is um, appropriate in this context is Ben Franklin's, who said, Three can keep a secret if two of them are dead. If you give your data to, to a company, that data is not yours anymore. And it's going to be used for a variety of purposes, including criminal investigations. Uh, we don't like it because we're giving a lot more data. We think it's creepy. Uh, but the fact is we keep doing it because on the whole, we'd rather have it. 
And the fact is, the question of what is creepy changes, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of close on, on this point. Um, Randy made uh, actually some points that I find very persuasive about not wanting to rely on the subjective impressions and values of 65-year-old judges uh, uh, and what they think is, uh, uh, is private. And, and he's right. The, they're completely out of touch, speaking as a 65-year-old. Uh, they uh, they don't know what the privacy expectations, of, especially technology-driven privacy expectations, are. And this, to my mind, is why the third-party doctrine makes so much policy sense. Once you acknowledge that our concept of what is private will vary, you have to have a way of saying, other than asking some judge, do, I, do you consider this novel technology or not, as if they knew, I, you, the only way to do it is to say, what are people giving away? If they're giving it away, they obviously do not feel about it the same way that they feel about the stuff that they're keeping. Uh, you are the last generation that will believe your location is profoundly private. Because I guarantee you that 14-year-olds all over this country are, one, getting phones that their parents paid for, and two, discovering that the first app their parents installed was a location tracking app to make sure they know where their 14-year-olds are. And so, you know, forget about authority figures like the U.S. government. Your parents know where you are. It's not a secret anymore. And they will never again believe in the way we do that, you know, people shouldn't know where I am. Uh, and the only way we're going to be able to understand the changing nature of people's privacy expectations is to ask, what are they giving it away? If they're giving it away, their privacy expectations are diminished. We may not like it. We may wish we didn't live in a world with automobile accidents or location tracking apps, but that's the world we live in. Uh, and uh, appealing to 65-year-old judges and saying, well, you don't like it, do you? Maybe you should change everybody's expectations is a recipe for massive judicial intrusion into a, uh, an area that I think will turn out to be the judiciary's Vietnam. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to open it up to the questions from the floor now, but I mean, the judge will do that. But I just have one sentence uh, just to remind you of a point that I made uh, earlier, just to keep our eye on the ball here. If the constitutional rationale that's being offered in defense of this NSA bulk data seizure program is accepted, it is not limited to telephone metadata. It would apply to any business record of any of our transactions. The same rationale that's being used here would apply to that, and it would not be limited to national security. Smith case did not have anything to do with national security. That information could then be used for any law enforcement purpose whatsoever, tax collection, anything else. So that's really what's being, what ought to be keep in mind. There's a lot of other things to keep in mind, but keep that in mind as well. The constitutional arguments made on behalf of this program, the third party doctrine, et cetera, the reasonable expectation of privacy arguments, et cetera, are generalizable to all business records and they're generalizable to any kind of illegal, uh, in law enforcement for any kind of illegality. Uh, there are. And health oh, there are. There, there and, are. Oh, oh yeah, and your digital health records. You'll be very happy to know that now that there's a special federal initiative to make all your health records digitized and therefore available for collection, dissemination, illegal leaking, uh, blackmail purposes, it's all now available. This is wonder a wonderful improvement in our it, lives. It's all available to contractors in Hawaii. There, there, there must be a, a hundred steps uh, of, a, of a staircase on that alleged slippery slope. The, uh, the, the arguments here are based in part on necessity, the fact that this data won't be available, can't be easily searched. Uh, this, was, this was exactly what the argument was on behalf of the individual, individual insurance mandate made by the government and its supporters. And that is, oh, this is just health insurance, this is just, uh, insurance is special, insurance is different. Insurance is special, insurance is different is not a constitutional limiting principle. It wasn't in that case. NSA is different, national security is different, is not a constitutional limiting principle. If you accept the underlying doctrines that are being asserted in support of this. If the supporters of this law want to come up with a new doctrine that is more limited, I will hear what that doctrine is. I'm open to hearing what that doctrine is. They have not presented it now. All you've heard, all you heard last night and all you heard tonight was Katz and Smith and Miller. That's all that you heard. Reasonable expectation of privacy and third-party doctrine. You did not hear another legal theory being offered. 
You hear, now you're hearing factual distinctions. We heard the very same thing when Commerce Clause and Necessary and Proper Clause arguments were being made in that Obamacare challenge. That is not going to cut it. So when we, if they make a limiting, if they have a limiting principle, let them put it forward, let them argue for it. That's not what's happened so far. I'm open to that. Let's hear from Professor Rapkin and then uh, Mr. Baker to uh, close just, before just the Just a very uh, quick response to what Stuart said about uh, how silly it is. Only Randy Barnett believes that your data is safer in the hands of the phone company than in the hands of the NSA. Uh, let me just say, the person who bought that distinction was President Obama, who you believe should not be deranging us. But it was President Obama who said, oh, well, there's 46 recommendations. Uh, I like that one. Uh, and why? I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think it's a little weird. The, the, the question is whether the NSA has access to it or not, with, not whether it's holding it. But Obama seemed to think that that would be very reassuring. Why? He probably thought there were a lot of Randy Barnett's out in the world. Yeah, I think Randy Barnett lives in his head. Uh, I, 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 so I, I, it, it's and, Randy I, Barnett derangement <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> Let's take I, questions I, I, from I the like, floor. I like my head. It's, 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 fun, up, it's fun upstairs. No, it's, yeah. you, you live in Obama's head. Okay, first question. Uh, Morgan Streetman from Tampa, Florida. I'm a practicing lawyer. And I'd be curious to know if the panel would like to comment on a state's rights aspect of this, because as I'm sure many of the individuals in this room know, we actually have a constitutional right to privacy enshrined in the Florida state constitution that says every natural person has the right to be let alone and free from governmental intrusion into the person's private life, except as otherwise provided herein. So how do, how do we deal with uh, state privacy issues that may vary across states when you've got a national collection program? I think if you're providing for the common defense, the federal government has the authority it needs to uh, uh, take actions to provide for the common defense, uh, uh, and therefore state law would be pre preempted. There was a great uh, little paper put out by the Center for American Progress, and they said uh, conservatives in various states are trying to invoke state law to limit uh, the NSA. Don't let them do that. We may hate the NSA, but if they do that uh, against the NSA, they will soon be doing it against Obamacare, so we have to stop them. And I thought, really, that's intriguing? Well, I, I should have sent it to Randy. <laughs> I do, uh, I do want to agree with something uh, important that I think, uh, a point, important point that Rachel Brand made last night about this concept of privacy. It's a very open-ended concept. I don't have a particular handle on what privacy is or isn't. I mean, it depends on the context. She laid out actually a number of alternative, interesting, reasonable conceptions of what privacy may be. That's the reason why I think the focus should go back to uh, property and contract. That is, I think that what you physically arrange your to be private, it, to be held in private when you close the door, uh, when you, whether that's of your house, of the phone booth, or, or you put passwords on your, your stuff, or you enter into contracts with uh, service providers that have privacy policies as part of their contract that can only over be ri overridden by government-compelled uh, si you know, subpoenas, but you have an expectation that that information is going to be used only for business purposes uh, and that the phone company can't, for example, use it to sell to telemarketers and all the rest, that that would violate their privacy agreement. So if you limit ourselves to property and contract, which was our historic focus, we don't have to talk about privacy in the abstract. We, have to, we can talk about the means that each one of us uses to indicate that that information will be kept private and from general consumption, and then government can get it with a warrant. Alex Knob, Savannah Law School. And I was wondering, when would I have a reasonable expectation of privacy using uh, this model that we've set up that once I hand my information off, it's no longer mine and I no longer have that expectation uh, because in the age we live in, uh, other than face-to-face -face conversation, I'm, I'm handing my information to another as an intermediary for delivery, whether it be email, mail, telephone call, any way that I contact, Facebook, Skype, the list goes on and on, there is that intermediary, and with our third party, I'm completely removed of any expectation of privacy. Let me, let me start with that. Um, Congress can pass laws creating expectations of privacy and has in, co in the context of many electronic communications and has set uh, a, a, a rather elaborate set of uh, rules for what uh, the government can get 
uh, when it can get it. Uh, I, and uh, it seems to me that the, uh, the fact is our expectations of privacy are going to change we're, uh, as they have already. You know, it used to be that we uh, were protected from having the words that we spoke to a newspaper reporter 10 years ago thrust back in our face uh, uh, by anybody because it was too hard to assemble clips files. Uh, uh, and the, when the FBI did assemble clips files, they were slapped down and prohibited from ever again gathering clips files on individuals without a predicate. Uh, which meant that on September 10, 2001, the only people in the world who could not do Google searches by name and print out the results were FBI agents. The rest of us had gotten used to the idea that, yeah, those embarrassing things you said to the reporter are going to live on. Uh, and our expectations of privacy have changed. That, that idea that the FBI couldn't do it looked stupid as hell. Uh, and all of those changes, the changes in what we share and the way it affects our expectation of privacy are going to roll over to government. We are uh, going to be shocked at the idea that our data can be used to sell us stuff. You know, we see that you're interested in TATP and bomb making equipment. Uh, maybe you'd also be interested in fuses. Uh, that you can get, but the U.S. government is not allowed to go looking at uh, uh, that data to find the terrorists. So that, that we're, we, if there ever is a circumstance where the government has stayed its hand because of some abstract, judge-written, kind of vague, I don't know, but I, this is creepy doctrine of privacy, uh, we're going to end up uh, uh, absolutely uh, appalled at the result. That's the Rabkin creepy doctrine to you. <laughs> That's right. There's a trademark now in that doctrine. Okay. Good morning. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Good morning. Thank you. John Kennedy, Concord. Um, what I have not heard, and I actually only heard the phrase one time, was acceptable risk. If we're not going to let FISA judges or 26-year-old U.S. attorneys or 65-year-old judges determine that, at what level and who decides when the risk is acceptable to release, not release, to find, to get um, that data, that correlated information that they're pulling from different places, when is it acceptable to, to go ahead and use it? When is it acceptable not to? And who makes that determination? Um, let, me, let me take that. I, there is no doubt that there is great power in this information, that there is great opportunity for abuse. Uh, we need as many institutional uh, restrictions on those abuses as we can come up with. Uh, um, and some of the technolo technological changes actually make that easier. We can do a much better job of auditing everybody who touches the data and uh, requiring that they provide uh, um, contemporaneous uh, um, justifications for that. And then we can go back uh, when data is misused and see who had access to it uh, and punish those people. Uh, and that is, those are all things we should be doing. We have a system now where three branches of government oversee this, where uh, misusing data for partisan purposes is something that is bound to uh, uh, trigger an investigation by people of the party that is being uh, uh, abused. Uh, all of those things seem to me to make sense. The thing you cannot do is say uh, uh, we're just going to make it all public uh, so that everybody can decide whether it's being misused because at that point uh, there's no point in even doing it. So I, I just want to extend your question to, to what, what seems to me really the implication. People are saying we need all of this information, we need all of this data, we need these cues, prompts, hints of who might be a troublemaker. Uh, so we actually had the Russian government, which is really good at surveillance and spying, tell us that uh, the, I forgot his first name, Tsarnaev, right, the, the, the older brother of the Boston bombing pair, uh, he's been hanging out with really bad people in Chechnya. You better keep an eye on him. So we knew, ah, it's even better than we, you know, his number was connected to other numbers. I mean, he'd been seen with scary people. What were we supposed to do with that information? Not let him back in America? He was, he, he was a legal resident. Uh, arrest him? Hold him in preventive detention? I, I mean, it, like, what, what were we exactly supposed to do? And people were saying, well, we should have monitored him. Really? 24 hours a day indefinitely? 
So I, I, I have no magic answer to your question, but I, I just want to remind you that it isn't just a question about information. It's about what are we really going to let the government do to protect us. And I think we're not going to let the government detain anyone and everyone who we have some idea might be a little bit uh, unreliable, right? So we're living with a lot of risk, and we feel that we have to live with a lot of risk. Um, because we think, no, there's certain kind of constraints that are important to maintain because uh, otherwise everything in our society will be swallowed up in the security law. And I, 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 I don't quite understand why people think, well, yeah, yeah, no, 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 of course we can't do preventive detention, but uh, that's no reason why we can't do anticipatory surveillance. I, I just think the idea of anticipatory surveillance is just... Right? You, you're looking at people who you have now no reason to, to be suspicious of, and you just think, you never know, something might turn up. That, that doesn't, to me, s seem like an American policy. Thank you. I'm Larry Smith, a concerned private citizen, slightly overwhelmed with all this. So that was a good segue into my question, which is really, when is the perceived need for absolute state security that has resulted in the progressive bracketing of the Fourth Amendment to the point that the exigent exception has become the rule going to be balanced against the real understanding, and as a physician, I understand this, that life itself is inherently risky, and that accordingly, when, the, when are or should the citizens, the judicial, the legislative community say enough because we have a right to a reasonable expectation of insecurity balanced by the personal responsibility for us to provide that for ourselves. It's more of a statement than a question. Did you have a question that to Dr. Smith? All right. Did the panel understand or are you locked in? Maybe 2017. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think it's very easy to talk about the right to a reasonable expectation of insecurity when we're sitting here in a comfortable ballroom. Uh, uh, the fact is, uh, if there's an attack, and there are certainly people who want to kill us in large numbers, uh, uh, we're not going to feel so comfortable about what a uh, reasonable expectation of insecurity feels like. Uh, uh, we, we cannot just say, oh, screw it. Uh, and uh, I fear that that is what we're doing. We're d going down a road which says uh, uh, we don't care. We really don't want these guys to do their job too well. You know, this is you know. You tell the FBI, you know, you got to watch everybody's rights. You got to be really careful. You got to have a justification for talking to an American uh, citizen. So they get a, a warning from the uh, the Russians. Not that this is. A, what, what was the word? A little bit uh, unreliable person, but somebody who's tied to terrorism. And they say, ah, it's not quite good enough for us to do anything. They didn't even interview him when he came back from uh, the Caucasus. Uh, so what, does that tell you? what does that tell you? What does that tell you? It, it, about it tells the me they are what, what does already tell you about the justification for collecting data on all of us when they get specific information about a specific person and they sit on it. They sit on their hands like. FBI agents tend to do a lot of. They do a lot of sitting around on their behinds. Yeah, because the, uh, the reward system increasingly is set up by this administration and by the Republican Party How do you, that do says you, actually you, know? you, will, you will get in trouble if really? you do something that can be you characterized know that? as disturbing. Stuart, you're familiar with this case. Do you actually know that the, uh, the officers that sat on that information, whoever got that and didn't do anything, you know that's why they didn't do it? Because I don't, and I don't think it's been reported, and I doubt there's been any investigation that's been made public. They just didn't do it. Now, when they start op acting on the basis of op operational intelligence they have, that is very specific, and that in this case, would, you know, don't talk to me about 9-11 at this point. Talk to me about Boston, the Boston Massacre. Um, and when, they did, when they had that information, they didn't do anything about it. I'd like to know what it is they're going to do with all the rest of the information that they are supposed to get in order to, what, uncover that. that that's what the NSA data thing was supposed to be uncovering, that. Well, they had the specific information, and they still didn't go, go no, to they, that. that I, I think that's... That's, that's a, that's that's a domestic terrorist attack. You keep threat. I mean, I, am very, I was very disturbed about 9-11, as most other people in this country were. <laughs> and I don't want to see another 9-11, and I think there's lots of things we should do to stop it, and I want these people to do their job. But I want these people to do their job, and they didn't. So we have, we have spent five years yelling about uh, intelligence abuses and privacy abuses, and we have 
elected and re-elected a president who bought into that. Uh, and it's no surprise that uh, if you're a, a, an intelligence uh, a terrorist investigator, you are cautious about what you do. You are risk averse. And you, you just don't know that that's what happened there. You don't know that. You're guessing. That's not, you're not saying that as a matter of authority. I don't know what happened, but neither do you. But what else? Do, is, is, your, is your position, is your position really, these guys, aren't doing anything, so they shouldn't have any tools to do anything with. The fact is, if you criticize them for uh, nothing but privacy abuses, what you get is an aversion to anything that could be criticized as a privacy abuse. I know abuse. law enforcement. I was in law enforcement myself. I think most of the people in law enforcement are good people, but it's not like on television. I mean, you just try to find a homicide detective who will actually investigate a mystery homicide. They are very few and far between. If they haven't got the guy with a smoking gun and a statement and, a, and a witness, an eyewitness that that's the guy that did it, they, they have very little to do with and that. And isn't this and precisely the, 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 the problem that everybody says, oh, well, law enforcement could have done the connection of the dots that was being done by the 215 program. But that would have required them to. The 215 engage. program didn't didn't stop the the Boston. Um, uh, it's because massacre. there, as far as we know, there was no communication across uh, uh, international lines to, that would have alerted anybody. To this this is a two-person uh, conspiracy. So the program didn't stop that thing. Great. Well, I mean, it doesn't stop two-person conspiracies. It's it's designed to uh, to stop large conspiracies that cross our borders. In a championship game, you let them play. <laughs> All right. Last question. My name is uh, Nick Chidiak. I'm the president of the George Washington chapter, and I have a question to start with, uh, with Mr. Baker. Uh, much of Professor Rabkin's uh, criticisms here um, focus on uh, the president's uh, lack of follow through and an apparent willingness to meaningfully reform some of the bureaucratic processes. So, independent of the overall legal structure that we put on our system, uh, what should we expect of our chief executive? Um, so what's it look like in terms of evaluating this president, future presidents? What should we expect from presidents in handling these issues? I think you need, you need a president who really is committed to uh, the special role of the United States in defending the order that we have uh, in the world to the extent we have one. Uh, we're always going to have an order. Uh, and this is as good as it's likely to get for us. Uh, I, and uh, we need to defend it or we'll start having one, uh, an order in which uh, 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 countries that would like a piece of their neighbor just take it uh, if they've got a bigger uh, army. We need a, a president who is absolutely committed to making sure that we don't have large-scale terrorist attacks uh, uh, on this country and who's willing to defend the agencies and the military that protects us from that. I, I don't think the president has been as serious about any of that as he should be. Any others? Join me in thanking the panel for today's discussion. <laughs>